it took me for years to decide to get my done mm-hmm. because I was like, am I doing this because I feel pressure to do it in order to assimilate with the way that the cisgendered heterosexual uh, culture that shaped the world has changed history in order to make us believe what is normal? Mm-hmm. Or am I doing it because I want big? <laughs> And I finally came to the realization, you've always had big energy. You've always been a bitch. You've just, you were uh, moonlighting in the itty bitty titty committee for a long time. And that's fine, but you graduated. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before we start, I do want to give a shout out to my sponsors today. If you are looking to up your game in the bedroom or you just, uh, I don't know, want to make yourself taste a little bit better for your partner, you should definitely give Popstar a chance. Um, They give you bigger loads and better taste. It's the only doctor developed, organic, high quality and made in the USA volume and taste enhancer. Um, Use code Holly for an extra 20% off of your first auto ship order just go to popstarlabs.com slash holly or you can also search for them on amazon all right so today my guest is less than four years into the industry and already has racked up a list of nominations a mile long not to mention several abn and flesh award wins too she is a trans performer that has been on a hot streak since she released her first scene and in my opinion probably the best dressed um individual in the entire adult industry let's welcome ariel demure Ooh, and you even said it right without having to be prompted. Oh, oh I was please. I was going to ask you before I did, but I was like, if I fuck this name up, then like I'm an idiot. No, uh, it's very easy to fuck it up. But Demure, not Demure. And uh, Ariel, not Ariel. Okay, so so what is, what is the one that you normally get? I get a lot of Ariel Demure. Demure? Demure. Yeah, it doesn't even sound nice. That, that sounds means rude. that people don't know what... The word demure means? Demure means. A lot of people don't know that's actually a word. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it all just harkens back to my humble upbringings. You should live your life humbly and modestly and not be a total dick to everybody <laughs> you meet. Yeah. I, um, I met a lot of people growing up that were really influential in the formation of who I was as a core person. And I was left kind of like, oh... Well, that was less than I would have hoped for. And so when I decided to get into performing, I had that frame of mind of no matter where you go or who you become, you should always be humble. Yeah. yeah. And always treat people kindly because you never know. Like, you just never you know. You really never know. You don't know if they're what struggle they're going through. But then from a selfish standpoint, you also never know. When you're going to need them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, it's funny how... The people you climb over on the ladder to success, you meet on the way back down. Yeah. yeah they say, Eddie like, Davis be kind to the pe- yeah, be kind to the people on the way up because you may need them on the way down. That's it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, I mean, speaking of Betty Davis, you obviously have this very, like, old Hollywood vibe and style. I'm assuming that was influential. I'm just a cultivation of, you know, it's all just a little bit of history repeating. I just, I was very influenced by a lot of really strong female people growing up. And I'm very big into film and escapism. And, you know, one of my strong suits in adult film is my ability to compartmentalize. And when I am on camera, that is a character that I've cultivated and it's strongly influenced by you know those women who were just unapologetically themselves Mm -hmm. and that speaks to me very Mm -hmm. deeply that just the chutzpah to just be yeah you know just exist and that resonates with people for some reason who who were some of like these influential characters like can you give us so many um, I would like to believe my porn persona is the intersection of Phyllis Diller and Monica Bellucci. 
Hmm. Somewhere in the middle. Okay. And know. what traits from like each person do you think so you feel really do? She was this larger than life, just cultivated character, mm -hmm. you know, outside of her drag, mm -hmm. outside of her persona. She was incredibly chic and incredibly educated and incredibly into a variety of different things that you wouldn't have expected out of this zany crackhead looking, you know, big bird woman. And uh, she was just larger than life and just all about the punchline. I think mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, she still holds the record or is one of the record holders for most laughs in a minute. Interesting. Yeah, she was she was just so good at her one liners. She has one of the records or had for a long time one of the records for just being able to deliver the most amount of jokes with laughs in a short period of time. Wow. And then uh, Monica Bellucci is the reference I bring to all of my plastic surgeons for <laughs> <laughs> everything I've ever had done. The only thing original on me still is my knuckles. And even those are covered in scars. But <laughs> um, she is this enigm enigmatic force where every time she's on camera, and it's funny, she plays so many different characters that um, people hate or have a disdain for her because she's so pretty. Mm -hmm. And I just find that so enigmatic. It's just mm -hmm. so weird. Like, mm -hmm. it's so strange. And she has this... Uh, ability to just captivate you mm -hmm. with saying so little she just dazzles every single time I see her and uh, I'd like to believe I'm somewhere in the middle like a sweet charity Shirley MacLaine mixed with a little bit of Jessica Rabbit yeah and, you know a little um share all that jazz <laughs> everything gay Liza Minnelli <laughs> That's a big influence too. God bless Liza. I will say like, um, you know, not to like out myself here, but my, my only experience with Liza Minnelli is seeing her on Arrested Development. Oh, that's not even the worst. That's not the worst. She was it's, great on Arrested she Development. She was incredible so funny. on Arrested Development. Um, and that was so her. She um, was is just this actor who throws herself into these roles and is just, she finds a way to turn every character into an authentic version of herself. Mm. And I found that is a really good tool for acting. I never got into porn because I wanted to be an actor. Mm -hmm. I don't think of myself as a good actor. I get the job done because I, I get it to some degree, but I'm not, I get the job done and mm. I'm proud to be able to do that. But she's able to take every character she does and make it authentic and make it herself, mm -hmm. which I find so endearing. Yeah. You know, she was born and bred into it. She was supposed to be what she's Yeah. Like. I mean, I know Judy Garland's her mother. I forget who her father was. Vincent Minnelli, a very talented director, great eye for cinematography. Right. So she was blessed on both ends with yeah. being so incredibly talented from two totally opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about you. Yeah. Um, so you started stripping when you were 18. Mm -hmm. How did that start? Yes. I was very fortunate to skip school one day um, and graduate. But I did skip school one day my senior year to go to the beach with my good gal pal. And all we had was, uh, am I allowed to be true? Like, yes. OK. So we had um, one of those coolers that had a built in Bluetooth radio a water bottle full of every alcohol that we had left over at the house and a hip scarf with all the jingle jangles on it. Mm -hmm. And this was when I was still very much finding myself and figuring out, and this was a long process. Um, and so we went to the beach and I was on the beach, shit faced middle of the day, the noon and I'm jingle jangle into Shakira and there was just this guy on the beach that day. And he turned out to be the DJ at a strip club in South Florida. It's such an echo chamber, but we're very fortunate in that there's so much going on as far as the sex industry goes. He was the DJ at a gay strip club that catered 
to older men who liked feminine young guys. Mm -hmm. So I just got, I hit the jackpot (laughs) and my whole life centers around that one day where that one man decided to give me a little bit of attention and say, do you want to be a stripper? And I said, <laughs> me? I mean, <laughs> look at me. I'm so little and so feminine. And uh, he was like, no, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And I'm going to show you the world. And he did. We ended up not even liking each other. Uh-huh. But, you know, I was 17 and he was looking for his fix. So we complimented each other for the time being. And from there on, it was history. Wow. Yeah. Do you talk to him anymore at all? Like I wish. I he's he was one of those like he's Cuban. Mm-hmm. He was 42 and um same age as my father, which when my family found out they were not thrilled about, believe it or not. Mm. Despite being very supportive of me my entire life, wasn't thrilled about me dating a 42-year-old. Yeah. And um so the uh Oh, oh, sorry. What was the question? Uh, do you talk to him anymore? Or like, have you? I've tried him? looking at. He was one of those very macho, like family men types, where he was like, "I don't have a Facebook. I don't have an Instagram." I mean, at the time, I don't even think Instagram was all that big. But, mm-hmm. um, so no, he's not on anything. And as far as I've heard, because I've asked around, he's like off the map. Mm. He's totally disappeared. So, can I say his name? If, if you want to. Well, William Fajardo, if you're out there, I'd like to say hello. Come see me sometime. <laughs> Come up and see me sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so this man, like, really changed your life. He really did, yeah. He, uh, well, what's also funny is that he hated when I would act feminine. And uh, he liked that I was small and young and young looking mm-hmm. and all that, but... Um, he hated when I would swish when I walked because I swished far too much <laughs> and uh, an unrealistic amount of swishing. <laughs> and, um, he hated that I would wear skinny jeans. And so he would try and butch me up. And that was like the first time a man really paid me a lot of attention. So I was mm-hmm. like having this internal battle. My whole life is around all the internal battles I've had every choice I've ever made. There was some sort of internal struggle I had to overcome and I had to make the decision. Do I want to pursue pleasing someone else with my aesthetics or do I want to be the most authentic version to who I am inside? And that was kind of where we dissolved because I was not willing to compromise on that. And he wasn't either Mm. because attraction is what it is you know Mm -hmm. that's something that I've learned in adult film that I'm very grateful to have learned because it's crossed over in my personal life it's all right to have certain preferences and to just be honest and forthcoming about that but you need to draw the line where those preferences become some semblance of discrimination or not giving people their um autonomy and Mm -hmm. allowing them to just exist Mm -hmm. having respect for everybody while maintaining like yeah i prefer blondes over redheads or whatever Mm -hmm. that's fine respect everybody though yeah treat everyone with equality and treat everybody like the human that they are yeah but um yeah i just wasn't willing to compromise on my femininity and i realized much later down the line, that was definitely the right thing to do. And it was also for a big reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, before we get into the reason, um, so did your mom know you were stripping? So my mom, I've always been very supported by my, my mother is bipolar. I'm bipolar. My father, when I was three years old, my grandma had a conversation with my father and was like, you know, that one's fruity. <laughs> and he's like, oh, it's a phase. Then four years old, I'm wearing dresses and, you know, doing all this stuff. And I was a very emotional child. And so I never came out for anything. Yeah. Not as trans, not as gay or anything. Everyone just accepted me as I was because it was apparent from a very young age. And um, my mother being that I'm a middle child, I'm the third born. And... uh, she just sort of saw herself in me and that I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to not be told 
when, where, and how. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to do it. And so she was a cocktail waitress at a strip club. And then her mother, my grandmother, was a bartender, a go-go dancer, and a cocktail waitress at strip clubs her adult life and always worked in bars. So she's very acclimated and familiar with the strip club lifestyle. And when she found out that I was dating a 42-year-old, she took a picture of his driver's license she took a picture of his license plate and she said, if you fuck with my kid, you're fucked, but do what you're going to do. And so did. So she asked him for his driver's license and he, like and he gave it to her. Oh, yeah. Wow. Because he got it. He understood what he yeah. was doing wasn't cool. Yeah. You know, in retrospect, yes, I'm aware that what happened was not ethical. However, a, it was a different time. You know, yeah. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And um, it's what was right for me at that time. You know, I think that we get a little too bogged down in the black and white in our culture. And there's room for nuance. And I'm grateful for, you know, my entire upbringing and how things went down, whether they were ethical or whatever the case may be, I'm still grateful that it happened the way that it did because it got me where I am now. Mm -hmm. But my mom knew like, you know, my child's going to do what my child's going to do. So I guess I've just got to figure out how to make this work to the best of my parental abilities. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of respect for parents because I am not one. So if a parent thinks that this is the right choice for their child, I try not to have an opinion on it because I don't have that lived experience and I don't think it's fair for me to speak towards things that I haven't lived personally yeah. and I'm not really informed on and being that I'll never, I'm not currently a parent. I don't think it's right for me to have a, an opinion on what parents do with their children and how they bring them up as long as it's as safe as they believe it can be. But um, yeah, sh- I told her, listen, you're struggling right now. I'm struggling right now. I'm going to start working at this club. And you know, because it was approaching my 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. And it was one week until my birthday. And I sat my mom down and I said, Mom, you know, I'm going to start working at this strip club that Will DJs at. She said, I had a feeling and I'm scared. And I just don't want to have you in that environment. And I said, A, this is probably a better environment for me than most others, mm-hmm. you know, at that, in that, at that time in high school, I, we would have conversations where, you know, in my AP art class, there was this kid who was telling me like, Oh yeah, if you ever go to Jamaica, like we probably just, um, uh, lynch you or something. And I'm like, Oh, that's a normal thing to say to a 17 year old. That's mm-hmm. normal classroom conversation, which obviously was, probably not true Mm -hmm. it was a very um specific point of view on a very specific thing going on but that was the way that people spoke to each other back then that was the way queer people were spoke down to is that like oh you're lucky to be in this country because we just kill you anywhere else so um stripping was safe in my mind in my mind, that was the best way I could have earned a living. And, and you were stripping at a club that like specifically was for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I told her, you know, this is going to work out great for us. We're going to have money. We're going to be able to like be comfortable. And so we cried together and we came to terms with it. And I was right. We She would come in and pick me up on the weekends from work because I would get off late on the weekends at like 3 a.m. And she'd be my ride home. She'd get in like 20 minutes before clothes. Everyone, my mom was always the prettier version of me. So she'd come in. There was this one time I was reverse cowgirl, just like bouncing up and down on this dancer's lap. And my mom walks in. I'm mortified. Mm -hmm. So I run into the back room, come out. Who's fucking bouncing on my (laughs) dancer's lap? But my mother, and so every single Is night- Is this seat she would, taken? Yeah, f- fucking bitch. I mean, honestly, seriously, you were scared to, for me to even be here, and now you're having more fun than I get to. <laughs> oh my God. So, and every night I'd have to pay her bar tab 
because she's like, well, you made money. So why would I pay for my tab? So <laughs> not only did she come around, she'd bring her friends in and like, it'd be a whole thing. It was a wonderful bonding experience for us because she knew what was going on. I was down for, you know, the life and it was so formative and, and wonderful. And luckily, because my father at a very young age just sort of came to terms with the fact that my child is my child. What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Um, there were never any fights about it. It was just sort of very matter of fact, like this is where we're at. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna meet you where you're at and love you anyways. God, that's amazing. Yeah, so many people don't have that story. Oh my goodness. I'm so cognizant of how lucky I am and how blessed I am. And I would say that I'm I'm still incredibly close to both of my parents, but my father I am really, really close to because he just gets it mm-hmm. somehow. I don't know how, but I don't I don't I don't know. He just gets it. And um, in recent years, my mom has, we had a a weird sort of in-between period when my grandmother passed because that was her mom and my grandma was like my best friend growing up. Mm -hmm. But um, we had a weird in-between time when I had to take over uh, and because all of my grandmother's daughters, my aunts and my mom, they sort of were just so done with the whole situation. I had to facilitate everything for the end of her life where we weren't in a good place. Mm -hmm. And since then we've become much closer because after that I ended up transitioning uh, and coming into my own a whole lot. And it was confusing for her because my whole family has just always accepted me as being feminine, Mm -hmm. but gender has never really been a question. Mm. It's always just been that one is very feminine. Mm-hmm. And an artist. Mm-hmm. And that's it. But I'm lucky to be so close with my parents. And so they're so understanding and supportive. And yeah, I am I get to lean on them when I need them. But this yeah. whole AVN thing at 3 a.m., I called my mother. It was 6 a.m. her time, thank goodness. Uh, so she was getting up for work. But she was able to just really talk me down and help me because we're cut from the same cloth. She's a Cuban woman who's very easy to fly off the handle Mm -hmm. and very quick to act without thinking. And I was able to talk to her and she really helped reframe things. So I was able to maintain a level head. God, that's you're lucky. I don't Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (sighs) Yeah, my I like to say blessed. Yes, absolutely. I am very much so not the norm. I am not the standard. Yeah, <laughs> but but it's great, you know, because your story shows that, like, you know, families can, you know, still support. 100%. I love hearing those stories of families who they might not necessarily have that lived experience, but they embrace and love and support regardless of what variables there might be that they don't fully grasp. Yeah, I mean, it, it all kind of comes down to, like, do you love your child for who they are or for who you want them to be? Yeah, 100%. You know, which I think is hard for a lot of people because we have these, like, we make these carbon copies of ourselves and then we're like, we, I want you to be this thing, mm-hmm. you know, and they may not turn Would out Would you say that, that your mom's influence on you was, like, kind of influential on you wanting to pursue your career or was that sort of a... Uh coincidence no I mean for sure like I I was always into photography like ever Artists. since I can remember yeah, yeah like Art. I started taking classes when I was 12 so like that was my obsession. right on so cool. um yeah so that was always my thing of course I didn't know think I was gonna work on porn when I was 12 um but you know. <laughs> thank goodness you didn't think it was an option yeah oh I mean you know like uh. I just figured I would do I don't know I just I guess I was like I'm gonna work in fashion yeah well um you knew it was photography. Yeah, yeah. From a young age, I always wanted to be a stripper, but I didn't think it was a possibility. I didn't mm. know how those logistics worked. But from a young age, the second I learned what a stripper was, much different upbringing, much different mindset. But yeah. I was like, oh, people who just like give you money because you're pretty? Yeah. 
I kind of like that. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I have to say that my mom like instilled in me, I mean, a lot of things, right? But the one thing that comes up a lot um, just over the years and all the different people I've worked with is just like, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter if you're a woman or like what you are. You know what I mean? Because like she, you know, I mean, she was came into her career and, and built her career in a time where she was the only woman. It, yeah, it's always been a boys club. So many yeah. industries, it was always a boys yeah. club. That's why I love sex works. One of the reasons I love sex work so much because historically, you know, if you've ever read The Art of Seduction, mm-hmm. sex work in a lot of different ways, and this is a blanket statement. It's a little bit generalized, generalizing, but sex work has always sort of been a woman's game in mm-hmm. a lot of ways and it's a way of reclaiming power mm-hmm. and I'm really into that narrative right yeah. now of feminine rage and reclaiming your power Yeah, you know and it doesn't have to be uh, guns blazing fists out you know it can be a lot more calculated and elegant yeah <laughs> I mean you know it's funny I mean obviously like I've encountered misogyny in my life I mean you know we all have but to a much lesser degree than what my mom went through, you know, I mean, she really paved the way for me and really other women in the industry. So I, I don't feel like I had to battle as much to get where Mm. I'm at as she did. But I also like was raised of this sense of like, I never thought that I couldn't do something or get somewhere because I'm a woman. Like I've never been like uncomfortable with that that scenario. Be a, yeah, a thing, a a blinder on you. How it, Oh my goodness. Because it's funny. Power, like, right? I am often, like, right now I'm actually working in tech and, like, I am the only woman in the office. And this happens a lot. I like, I, I often find myself in situations I'm like, but I don't even think about it. Like, I don't, like, it does, it's not something that occurs to me. All of a sudden, I'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm the only woman here. Where else she at? Huh. <laughs> okay. But, like, it's not something where I'm like, oh, I'm the only woman here. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even, no. I'm like, this is Matter a person. Fact, I am a person and we are all doing this job and I'm very capable of this thing. Only red hand in the room. Interesting. <laughs> Curse. Yeah, I Whatever. mean, exactly, right? So, and, you know, I wouldn't, I think, have that kind of feel that way if my mom hadn't raised me with a sense of being like, yeah, you are you can do whatever you want. Like, it doesn't. It ends up to open-minded parents. You know? And then also, yeah. I know, right? Oh, yeah. Look how great we turned out. <laughs> red winner <laughs> so um uh let's take a quick commercial break and then when we come back i definitely want to talk about like your transition and sure. and all that and uh we'll be right back picture this so you're gearing up for a first date the excitement and the nerves are kicking in But what if there was a secret to boosting your confidence and performance in the bedroom? Introducing Blue Chew, the discreet and convenient solution that's revolutionizing the way that people approach these first dates. With Blue Chew, you can be your best self no matter what the circumstances. It's time to take control of your sex life. Visit bluechew.com today and unlock your potential. Conquer those first date jitters. Be your best self every time. Discover your options at bluechew.com. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code HOLLY to receive your first month for free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And thank you, Blue Chew, for sponsoring this podcast. Hello, everybody. We are back. Okay, so Ariel, tell me tell me about your transition. Like, when did you realize that that was something you needed to do? What a journey. Um, <laughs> so... When I first started transitioning, it was in South Florida, uh, 19, 20 years old, me and a few gal pals, we all came to the realization like, oh, I think I'm trans, because we would like go out and drag together. Mm -hmm. And then we realized like, this doesn't feel- Like you're dressing up. Like performative. This feels like just kind of right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we realized in a, time where gender therapists I the concept had never even crossed my mind we're all trans and back then you used to be able to buy your hormones online uh, in housepharmacy.com mm-hmm. so we were taking everything we were taking blockers we were taking shots we were doing patches we were doing progesterone all at once I ended up overdosing on hormones and develop, developed a cyst on my thyroid the size of a golf ball overnight wow. and uh, freaked myself the fuck out ended up having this huge existential like spiritual 
uh, awakening. Wouldn't have traded it for the world. Became like really involved in religion and just searching spirituality and figuring out what is my relationship with my creator? Who do I believe God is? Who do I believe I am as my spirit? Became really um, at peace with the idea that this is a skin sleeve. This is literally just a decoration for the soul. And what it looks like speaks so much less towards who I am as a person than who I choose to be as a person. Mm. So I really stopped looking at the aesthetics and focusing on me as a person and my spiritual growth. There's a really beautiful uh, excerpt from the Talmud that I'm trying to memorize right now. It's on my phone, but it basically speaks towards... uh, be uh, in love with grace now and just because don't be worried about the existential worries of the world however do not dismiss them you're still a part of it you Mm -hmm. know so do what you can that is good essentially Mm -hmm. I completely mucked that up but um, I, I just saw it like yesterday and I'm like holy shit that's like my whole MO that's Mm -hmm. what I've been trying to do this whole fucking time all thinly veiled and laughs and wigs but um so i uh moved to los angeles and was exposed to all these different words i'd never heard of um in south florida like i said it's a very isolated echo chamber and all of my friends and colleagues were like if you are a trans woman that means this and you like this and you sleep with these people and you act like this in public and One thing that I do try and hold on to that I learned back then is the way you leave the house is the way you return. Don't take off your shoes. Don't take off your lashes. Don't take off your (laughs) lipstick. The way that you left is the way you go home. That's one thing. And you're not done until you have your earrings on. That's another (laughs) thing that I really hold on to. But um, so I moved to Los Angeles. I was introduced to all these different concepts, non-binary and uh, gender fluid and pansexual and all these words I'd never heard of. And... I was like, oh, there are other people who feel the way I feel because I had fully detransitioned. I was living as a very, very feminine man. Mm -hmm. And I was okay with that. You know, a lot of people like to say I was born in the wrong body, X, Y, Z. My lived experience is I was born in a body and I was born in a Ferrari, but I was really a Porsche. There was nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. The insides were still lovely. They just didn't really match up. So I just had some, you know, fabrications done Mm -hmm. to make the outsides more authentic to what the insides were. Mm -hmm. And granted, I'm not a mechanic, so uh, my analogy could be flawed. But sounds good to me. I know nothing about cars. So I don't know shit about cars. (laughs) But I do think that would be a fun hobby when I get old. I might want to take up some mechanics classes because I tell you what, highway robbery, those mechanics all (laughs) the time. Seriously. But um, that's why I don't drive. But in any event, I realized, okay, so you definitely are not Mm cisgendered. That Mm -hmm. is a given. Let's extrapolate on that. So when I first began medically transitioning, I used the term non-binary because I did not identify with a lot of the uh, very binary trans women that I were was friends with in South Florida. So I thought, okay, well, I don't feel a lot of the same feelings as these trans women. So that means I must be something else. What kind of feelings were those? Well, there's just very, uh, once again, my experience, part of me, mm-hmm. I felt that these women were very much stuck in these heteronormative gender roles of okay so and there's still a lot of trans women who feel this way and it's whatever that's their experience and it's all whatever cool but um things like okay so you should strive to be passing you should strive to look a certain way as to not be perceived as trans Mm. A lot of trans women do not want to be perceived as anything but 
a woman. Mm -hmm. And while I do feel that I am a woman and I will use that word to describe myself, I am also cognizant of the fact that I am a trans woman. Mm -hmm. So when it, when you're getting, when you're getting down to brass tacks, it's all just words, right? you know, that we're bickering over. And the English language is hugely flawed in and of itself. So why are we bickering over something that is not infallible? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not perfect. Why are we fighting over these words? If at the end of the day, what we want is action and justice and equality, I feel like we're getting a little too distracted with words. You want to fight with me about chromosomes? It, I don't fucking care, my guy. I don't <laughs> care. I'm living my life authentically for myself. And this is where I have a lot of discourse with other trans women that I grew up with in that my uh, gender presentation is not performative for other people. Mm-hmm. I Every single thing I've done, it took me for years to decide to get my boobs done mm-hmm. because I was like, am I doing this? because I feel pressure to do it in order to assimilate with the way that the cisgendered heterosexual uh, culture that shaped the world has changed history in order to make us believe what is normal? Mm -hmm. Or am I doing it because I want big titties? (laughs) And I finally came to the realization, you've always had big tit energy. You've always been a big titty bitch. You've just... You were uh, moonlighting in the itty bitty titty committee for a long time, and that's fine. But you graduated. I feel like that's one of the most profound things I've ever heard. I'm not, actually not joking. I like <laughs> love the way you put that. That is like <laughs> that's a highlight clip. Ah, sure. well, yeah. So I just realized every, and this I get from my mother and my father, and it's one of my hugest flaws and one of the, my greatest strengths. It's that. I will not do something because I feel pressure to do it. I will do it because it feels right for me. Yeah. And every surgery I've had, every choice I've made in my career, I have made because it's what I felt at the time was the most authentic thing to do for myself. Mm -hmm. And what's ironic is a lot of those things are at the end of the day, um, performative, Mm -hmm. you know, do I make the choice to perform or do I make the choice to take a step back and not do anything? And to everything there is a season, you know, sometimes I will just take a step back and I'll just not do anything. But um, yeah, I found that especially with my gender, now I am very comfortable in the concept that I am a woman, I am a trans woman, but it took a lot of growing to get there. And I think that there are a lot of people, especially with mine and the younger generation, with millennials and Gen Z, who want to be louder than everybody else and they want their opinion to be heard because historically, if you shout the loudest, you're the one that's going to close mouths, don't get fed. Mm-hmm. But Um, I think that if you don't have that lived experience, if you haven't been on this earth for a certain amount of time, maybe your voice needs just a little bit more maturing. Maybe Mm -hmm. your point of view just needs a little bit more extrapolating Mm -hmm. before you go out there and you start being an ambassador for people. Mm. You know? Yeah. We saw it with this last award cycle. And every year, honestly, I saw a lot of people with a lot of really strong opinions. But at the end of the day, let's listen to the veterans. Let's listen to people with lived experience. And we're born with two ears and one mouth. We need to learn to use them proportionately. I heard that was a Mary Kay uh, quote. I don't think it's a Mary Kay quote, but I heard it was a Mary Kay quote. Okay. I I want to give that woman credit for for that. But (laughs) um, I, I think that people ask questions in order to give their opinion as opposed to hear the answer. Yeah. Like, let me say what I'm going to say. And then you're going to say what you're going to say, but I'm actually not listening. I'm waiting for you to be oh, done yeah. so I can say the thing that I need to say. 100%. And learning to listen is is something that's that's very 
hard. And I actually have to say this podcast taught me that like the greatest gift that this show has given me is teaching me how to listen and giving me the opportunity to talk to people like you about your lived experiences, which makes me like just a wiser, like person. Like it's so fun. A gift. It really is. And such a, like a curse. But yeah. It's so. But what I love, like what I love about your, you know, hearing your story and hearing like transition stories of other trans people that I've had on the show. And, you know, I know it's like the one thing that everybody wants to hear about because it's such a hot topic. But for me, I love it because it's like, it's this story on a much bigger and more visible scale of somebody just trying to find out who they are. And that's what we're all doing. Yeah. That's the human experience. Truly. You know, and like it moves me. I I remember Natasha Dreams coming on and telling me that, you know, I think the first time she dressed up Lover too, she like found her, she was like, oh, this is who I am. And there was something so powerful about that moment. I like started to like well up because I was like, what an amazing experience yeah. to suddenly be like, this is, you know what I mean? Yeah, like that thing absolutely. that we're always searching for. Yeah. We're always searching for like, who am I? Who, am, what is my authentic self? Like, mm. what do I want in life? And then like to have that experience be like, this is it. And especially in the face of so much adversary, mm-hmm. you know, and and so much noise and politics and all this shit. Like, and I think that's why there's such a amazing. juxtaposition between the generations because for so long, I mean, once again, this is me, of me my perception of an outside world that i don't have lived experience in but i feel like there's such a a battle over um gen x and millennials and gen z because i feel that for so long people just sort of lived with that discomfort Mm -hmm. looking at my parents and my grandparents i see them struggling with something and instead of trying to find a solution or change something they're just like well that's the way it is life sucks and then you die is yeah. literally something that should be put on a pillow in my grandmother's house <laughs> life sucks and then you die yeah um but i don't believe that to be the case i believe every there's a solution for everything and sometimes it's going to be a hard one and sometimes it's not going to be a pleasant one and sometimes the end result isn't ideal but i choose not to live in misery. Mm-hmm. I think it was Kim Cattrall who said, I don't want to be uncomfortable or in any situation that makes me uncomfortable for more than 15 minutes. Mm. Fucking let that sink in. Like for that mentality. Yeah. Fucking badass. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I can get behind that. You know, I refuse to put myself, unless it's a necessity, you know, like recovering from a surgery. Yeah. But. Being in- Getting a um, col- Colonos- colonoscopy. No, the well, not that thing. <laughs> so, no, I, someone, remi- someone, yes, colonic. <laughs> someone reminded me the other day I have to go get a colonoscopy soon. I was like, fuck me. Ah, Christ. But, yeah, some things you can't work around, but no. <laughs> yeah, if I can avoid it, if I can work through it, mm-hmm. sometimes you can't go around it, you can't go over it, you got to go through it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll i make it happen in order to find peace. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, where there's a big disconnect, where a lot of people just accept being uncomfortable and annoyed. And I embrace uncomfortability. I embrace awkward moments, but I'm not going to live in that. Yeah. I want to move through and forward. Yeah. You take those opportunities to maybe signal to you that this is a time that I need to enact some kind of change. Oh, yeah. Whether that Change. change be changing your environment or your perception, right? Like yes. One of the two. Yes. Oh, and my I, goodness. Find I, a way to just ch- get a new perspective. Yeah. Like yeah. I I, come in, I kind of approach a lot of issues that I have with that mindset. Okay. Is this something that I can actually change? Like, can I change this? Can I not talk to this person anymore? Can I not come to this place anymore or whatever? So true. Or do I have to just change the way I'm looking at these things? A hundred percent. It's got to be at one of the two. hundred percent. Yes. I'm with you. Yeah. Totes. Totes. So, um, so let's talk about porn. Oh, <laughs> so how did, how did that happen? How did your entry into the adult industry happen? Was bartending at a trans show bar strip club. And one of our customers was the owner of an escort agency. Mm-hmm. And at that escort agency, he had connections with groovy girls. Mm. Uh, at the time, it was called She Male Yum. How far we've come. 
Stephen Gruby is such an asset to the community because look at this man who is making money with from trans women and seeing like, oh, that word that was totally normal to me and like not a big deal. Apparently, the girls don't like it. Let me change my entire company, the entire award show that I created, like all of these different things. He said, oh, you guys don't like that? That that hurts you and I'm making money because of you? Let me fix it. Yeah. And he did. So that is an ally. That is someone who is on our side. That is someone that other people should be learning from. Mm-hmm. Um, can't speak highly enough about Steven, but so uh, he, this uh, es- escort manager, he got me a couple solo shoots. Please don't look them up with <laughs> Groovy. And that was just sort of a rite of passage in South Florida. You just did a few solos with Groovy. And yeah. if you wanted a little extra money, you'd do a hardcore. Mm-hmm. And then you have sex with someone on camera. Mm-hmm. You don't do your solos. And um, then I moved to Los Angeles because I was a makeup artist and I wanted to pursue that as a career. Mm -hmm. I was teaching makeup in South Florida for two years at the place where I got my esthetician's license. And a part of the curriculum was that Los Angeles was the epicenter for um, just celebrity makeup. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to work in print or in fashion or anything like that in New York. So I said, why not Los Angeles? So I moved here with a little bit of money and um, one family member who was wonderful enough to put me up for six months. And then I got my studio and I was able to thrive because I believe in living below your means. And that's why I'm not flashy on the Instagram and the social media. It just doesn't speak towards my poor white trash nature. (laughs) And um, I, the pandemic happened And I had the freedom because I escorted the whole time Mm -hmm. Uh, from 17 years old and upwards. I was escorting and I loved it. I got into it for probably the wrong reasons, but I stayed in it because it spoke to me on a spiritual level and it fueled me creatively. How so? That's such an interesting take. Um, So I got into it, I think, for that sort of because I was always growing up like very asexual in perception the way people looked at me they didn't think I literally had someone in the sixth grade tell me I don't think of you as a boy I don't think of you as a girl I just think of you as you Mm -hmm. and I said well that's rude but (laughs) that's sort of the consensus is on how a lot of people viewed me so I was sort of reclaiming my sexuality at 17 and really figuring out myself in a lot of ways and escorting sort of gave me this power that I didn't know I had and made me feel uh, perceived correctly Mm -hmm. as a erotic um, entity as a as more than just uh, something aesthetically pleasing but as something to be coveted Mm -hmm. and I, I enjoyed that after evolving, I learned that's not the best reason to get into sex work. You should get into sex work because of X, Y, Z reasons that are more for you. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, escorting is not something I get to do often because of my current place in the industry. And it's uh, just not facilitatable for different reasons. But um, it always brought me so much joy because I was and this is the big juxtaposition between porn and escorting with porn there's so much false narratives and so much like faking it and and putting on a show with escorting my client was always there because they were so enamored and so excited and Mm. genuinely looking forward to being with me and turned on by me that that would in turn turn me on. Yeah. And then I have this person who's not conventionally attractive. I can count probably on one hand how many aesthetically pleasing clients I've had in my mm-hmm. life, but that's not why I do it. I do it because they're so into it. Mm-hmm. That gets me into it. And now we have this symbiotic exchange where I'm having a genuine sexual experience 
that is gratifying for me because I know that they're getting something out of it and I'm getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. And it was, it would just give me so much dopamine and I would come out of it just feeling so creatively charged because I'm like, what am I going to do with this energy now? I'm going to go paint. Like it would just be so like fuel for me. And it brought me so much joy that not only was I able to give someone a genuine experience, I always considered myself a happiness consultant. And I liked having um, married clients because I felt that they were, a lot of the time it would be like 15 minutes of sex and then the rest would just be chat. I hear that from almost every girl who escorts. Who enjoys it. Yeah. It's and like, it's mostly it's, it's just so people who great. want companionship. People who just want someone to be there for them. Yeah. And we would be able to talk. Uh, my regulars leading right up until I kind of had to take a back seat from escorting. They were all married. And we would talk about their marriages and how they met their partner and how happy and the da, 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 da. And then, well, I'm trying to think about this and I want to do this and she's not cool with this. And we would get to like extrapolate on that and we would get to figure out, you know, solutions and just decompress together. And it would be so illuminating that I feel like they would go home to their wife and be so appreciative of what they have at home mm-hmm. because I pose no threat to their wife. If anything, wouldn't you rather have your husband having sex with a prostitute, someone who's getting tested every two weeks as opposed to their secretary. Oh my God, 100%. And it's funny. Who they're going to have an emotional infidelitous relationship I've with. I've literally said, <laughs> said this to my husband, who's a very normal guy, who's like, you know, we have a very like standard relationship, yeah. like great relationship. Like, But I've said this to him, I'm like, babe, you know, if you ever want to have sex with somebody else, like, I understand. I'm like, I would just prefer it be a sex worker so that I know it's like oh, a transactional relationship. Yes. And I'm like, and I could even help you find somebody that I trust. And he just looks at me. He's like, you're Ooh, out of your goddamn you mind. You are the one. No, but you know what he says to me? He goes, why don't you just give me blowjobs more often, babe? He's like, I don't want to fuck anybody. Hey, communication. And I was like, okay. Fine. Wow. You know what? All right. That's communication. But it was like, yeah. Healthy. I mean, that's like. I, you know, and I've said this to him a couple, and he always looks at me like I'm insane. He's like, I don't want to be with anybody else. I'm like, but never change your mind. Like, just know there. that door is open. Oh, I'm open fabulous. to that discussion. Yeah. But like, let's, you know, like, let's, let's do this in a way that I'm comfortable with. Fuck yeah. Boundaries. Yeah. Boundaries. I've been the third so many times. Everyone's fucking looking for a goddamn unicorn. <laughs> and uh, it's so just baffling all these poor, a lot of the time, women who feel pressured to do these three ways because they want to make their man happy. And it's like, dude, this is not healthy communication. Yeah. You're here and it's not fun for us. And because I'll be, I'm a facilitator. Mm -hmm. I'll be all up in it. I'm making sure she's taken care of. We're focusing on her. We're doing the, you're up there and I'm down here. I'm on duty. All right. You need to switch places. Let's do it. I love it. Ooh, you feel (laughs) good. You know, like I want to make sure everyone's having a good time. Second, he touches me in any sort of way, mood shift. Mm. And I'm like, dude, this is what I was trying to avoid. Why'd you gotta, why'd you ruin everything? Yeah. Oh, come on, guy. You know, you already got what you wanted out of the situation. Now she's uncomfortable. Now I'm in the middle. <sighs> that is awkward. It's so annoying. Just like be a fucking grown up. Watch porn together first and go from there. Yeah. I mean, that's the first step. Yeah. So, okay. So escorting, you you obviously had an affinity uh, for it. And then uh, you start doing these solos. Yeah. For Groovy. And then tell us about like your first scene with another person. So I decided to do studio work because I realized makeup artistry was not filling up my tank. It was a hobby. It was something I could enjoy doing, but it was not something I could see myself doing long term Mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. I woke up one day, looked in the mirror, said, you're going to be an old man one day. You need to get on hormones. Woke up one day, looked in the mirror and said, do you really see yourself being 70 years old and still doing makeup? You have shitty knees now. Like standing for that long, yeah. are you sure that's what's going to happen for you? And I realized sex work is something, even when I was successful and pay- paying my bills with just makeup, I would come back to sex work because I missed it. Mm-hmm. That stimulation that I would get, that 
recharge, the creativity that I felt afterwards. It was something that I was craving. So I realized I want to be in sex work for the rest of my life Mm -hmm. in some capacity, Mm -hmm. one way or another. It just makes me happy. And um, so I decided to get into doing studio work because I wanted to, I had ulterior motives. Jim Powers contacts me and says, do you want to do a scene? And right up until I show up on set, I think I'm being sold into sex trafficking. I don't feel like it's real. It feels so surreal because he said, you're going to be with, and I'll get to this, you're going to be with a top performer. You're going to be doing this scene where you have lines. You're going to be paid this much money. And it was all just so fast. It all happened over a weekend that I'm like, it can't be real. It's too good to be true. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just coming from the strip club world, used to things being very seedy and sort of a little bit more, it felt under the table. This all felt really legit. Mm -hmm. And I show up and it's all real and it's all so relaxed and like fun that I was just like, this is too good to be true. And, um, you know, my first scene didn't go as planned. It didn't go the way that I wish it would have, but it still happened. And I'm glad that it happened that way. The way I learned to drive was in my father's work van. No rear view mirror. Um, Huge, huge blind spot. And my dad was like, if you can learn to drive in this, you can drive anything. And that's kind of how my first scene was. If you can do this, (laughs) you can do anything. And that's how my second scene was too with Joey Silvera, where he is... I was, I didn't even know who he was until I was told like, okay, this guy's a big deal. And so I do my research and I'm like, holy shit, this is a big deal. Okay, cool. And he was one of the best directors I've ever worked with because he had such a specific vision and he had such specific requirements for what was needing to be met. And he's not the most communicative person. He has terrific artistic, creative ability but if you if you don't do it then okay fine whatever moving on you just have to get it you have to be on you have to be on point you have to be paying attention and i'm so grateful that that's how that went because from every scene after that i feel like i was ready and i was prepared Mm. and to this day jim powers and joey silvera are two of my favorite directors which is so a blanket statement to say because I love 99% of the directors I've worked with. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm fortunate in that most of the directors I've worked with have been amazing. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, they're also unique in their uh, the way that they approach the scene. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, my first scene ever, I do want to clear up one thing Dante Cole I do not hate you I think you're lovely I think you're a lovely gentleman and I think you're so talented I don't hate you I don't know where that got started but so many performers have told me why do you hate Dante and I don't hate Dante it was a hard day it was an 11 hour day where we were working in a uh, um, loft with no AC in the middle of summer oh god and, so, and it was a hard day for both of us. He was, he had just gotten out of court, you know, for a speeding ticket. Neither one of us were <laughs> uh, at our best, mm-hmm. you know, and um, it, it was a hard day. But for some reason, uh, people have taken that story that I tell and, and told him that I hate him. I don't hate him. I think he's lovely. He's a really, he's, he's, he's a, a lovely, lovely person. Guy, yeah. But it was a hard day. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really hard day. Dude, some days... For my first scene ever. It yeah. was literally balls deep. We're taking sex stills. And Jim is like, you know, this is her first scene. And he's like, this is your first scene ever? And I'm like, yeah, can we keep going? <laughs> Let's not get distracted right now. My wig's going to fall off. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, man. I got to tell you, like, I always dreaded summers when I was shooting production because it was like, and I and I and I got to I actually got to a point, you know, when I was shooting for twisties all the time where I was allowed to say I am not shooting outside and I am not shooting in any 
um, locations that don't have air conditioning during the months of July, August, and September. Yeah, fair, good for you. And I'm like, right this on. Is how it is. Hold strong. Yeah. <laughs> because like, I had to yeah. make the decision: do I prefer hot or cold? And I've decided that I will take a hot scene over a cold scene because it's impossible to maintain an erection when it's ice fucking cold. Yeah. You know, if it's hot, at least I'm not dying. But there's good and bad with both of them. Yeah. They're both fucking rough. Yeah, they're both awful. So, um. In uh, 2022, you had four ABN nominations, which was more than any newcomer in history. That's news to me. That's news to me, Grateful. too. Grateful. But uh, it, it's it's right here in writing. Hey, so, it happened. <laughs> so it has to be true. Um, how did that accomplish make, accomplishment make you feel so early in your career? I've always been cognizant of the fact that I am blessed and fortunate. And I just try and use that as a platform to be the best version of myself and speak towards those who are disenfranchised and don't get the opportunities that I get Mm -hmm. because I was not the most attractive person in the entire world for a long time. So I had time to build up a personality and that's so crazy because I told you like when you came in and you were just sitting over there, I was like, God, you were like, so your face is like a God bless Monica Bellucci. She helped me out a lot. Yeah. But but you also like clearly, I mean, because you said, you know, obviously you cultivated a surgeon. Oh, yeah. Oh, many great. surgeons, but thank you. But very, um, yeah, I, I'm very grateful. Uh, it, it, you know, I was also the top selling trans performer according to the AEBN for the year of 2024. I was number one in the second quarter and fourth quarter, but I was the top selling performer for last year. And I think that just speaks towards the fact that I show up, I do my job the best that I can with what I'm given, and I try and be a team player to the best of my ability. I'm not perfect, and I fall short sometimes but I always try and deliver a solid product with what I've learned. And uh, I think that just, you know, it's all encapsulated in that. I yeah. just, I try and I try my best and I try not to say no to work. Right. You know, I was taught you're only going to be pretty for so long. Enjoy it while it lasts. So Have you ever had a I scene am. that you really regret doing? No regrets. No, I've turned down scenes that felt wrong. And I was right in doing so. Um, I won't do things that don't feel ethical. Mm. I will, however, I think fetishes are meant to be explored. Mm -hmm. And they are a healthy way for people to explore things. So I'm, in my personal life, not into like sissification Mm -hmm. or, you know, forced anything. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that people explore that and then learn why. They like that Mm -hmm. as a way to just become better, more educated, fully rounded humans and learn how to navigate the world more tactfully. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't have any regrets as to the work I've done as of yet. We'll see. (laughs) There's still time. There is still time. (laughs) Um, So this year at the AVN Awards, uh, many people said that they felt that trans performers were underrepresented this year. How do you feel Amongst about that? others, um, yes, trans performers were a touch underrepresented, but I think the bigger issue because uh, BBW performers were really up underrepresented this year. Uh, um, MILF performer of the year was not announced as a main category. Um, the women who have been in this industry for longer than most of us, who the industry has built off of, you know, Brittany Andrews, Penny Barber, you know, these performers who deserve their flowers, uh, they didn't get the airtime that they deserved either. And from a monetary standpoint, I understand we have to keep time. We have to prioritize sponsors. We have to prioritize um, uh, investors. And there is a show that has to be put on that is uh, suitable for the streamers. But at the end of the day, there were things that were said that just simply are not factual and are just examples of people trying to cover their ass. Um, We need to have an open dialogue And we need to be more receptive 
to other people's feelings because at the end of the day, an award show is an opportunity to get dressed up, hang out with your friends and pat each other on the back. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you win an award, lovely. But at the end of the day, that acknowledgement is what's really so gratifying because you work so hard all year. Just getting that acknowledgement is so rewarding Mm -hmm. in itself. And the opportunity and, to go and like support your yeah. peers and like and, cheer um, for other people. The the one thing that just really hurt so much was that not even the acknowledgement was there. It was all pushed towards the end. Why at this day and age in 2024 with the numbers that we have to support our opinions, uh, are we pretending – because it's a double-edged sword – I feel so often that as trans people, we're sort of made to feel like A, we're lesser than, and B, we're so niche. We're so like, oh, that's such a, uh, who actually watches that kind of porn? Bitch, a lot of people. (laughs) Brazil, we're the number one fucking streamed category, okay? That's a huge fucking country. Um, So fuck off. You're an idiot for thinking that and saying it out loud, you douche. Uh, But besides that, um, you have that thought process. And then I can't walk down the street without getting catcalled. So you can't have it both ways. You can't be sitting there having me be the uh, this archetype that you want to push so much eroticism and so much fetishism onto and then tell me that I'm not coveted and I'm not actively making you a lot of fucking money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so silly. So, and then same thing with BBW and same thing with MILF. You're not telling me that I've been doing nothing but stepmom porn for a year because it's not making you money. Give the MILFs, who are actual MILF age, their flowers that they deserve and maybe let's prioritize that over... 10 categories over people who aren't actually here or uh, people who have gone on stage a dozen times in one night, you know, like we know where we're going. We know what the direction is. We know when we're planning these things, how things are going to unfold to some degree. Mm -hmm. We're going to bank on the fact that we're going to run a couple hours late because we've been a couple hours late for the past 30 years. (laughs) You know, like, let's just call a spade a spade. Never, ever start on time, ever. So um, we're all aware that's how this is going to go. How about let's prepare for that? Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I wish porn would focus on more is not focusing on what's making us a dollar now, Let's focus on where the dollars are going to come from in a few years. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it almost like the weather where we're forecasting as opposed to preparing for what's happening right this very second. Mm -hmm. You know? Okay, yes. Stepmom. Super good right now. What do we think based on what's been popular over the past 10 years is going to be the thing next year? Mm -hmm. Maybe let's get ahead of the curve and and start some shit. Let's let's be at the forefront of making content and doing something differently as opposed to just riding the coattails of somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know? It's so insane. But yeah, we um a lot of the girls got together and we said, "Okay, how much of this is displaced anger and how much of this is legitimately a snub?" And we all enjoy the AVN. We all love going. We're all grateful to be accepted there and allowed to be there because there was a time when we weren't necessarily allowed to be in certain spaces. Mm -hmm. And we've made strides and we're happy about those strides in the right direction. However, the fact that we're still having this conversation 10 years later um, is kind of baffling. So we really just want to meet in the middle and just have that dialogue because it's time. You want to be on the right side of history You know, like Mm -hmm. porn is where we all we're the testing ground for so much, you know, boogie nights when they did that, um, like, oh, are we going to go stay film or are we going to go to to digital and like video? And they tested it out with porn first. And then what happened? That's exactly where all the theaters went. They went the other direction. They did it with DVDs. 
We were the Porn testing. Porn at the forefront of all Everything, of the every industry. Changing. We were the testing the inter- ground. Internet. The internet, DVDs, all of it. Yeah. Por- uh, fucking uh, YouTube was initially like a dating service, if I'm not mistaken. Like it's all been a re- revolving around eroticism. Why are we pretending that these disenfranchised people don't have the right idea? Mm-hmm. It's so antiquated. It's mm-hmm. so exasperating that we're still having this conversation. So a lot of us girls got together and we said, how much of this is just us being angry and how much of this is justified? And so we got together and we uh, wrote an open letter with a lot of cis, fem- uh, cis performer allies so we could get an outside perspective. And a lot of us feel the same way. And we are gathering signatures now. We're over six, 70 si- signatures on this open letter. We're going to be putting it out any day now. We just want to get it really, really solid um, with the support that we're getting because there are so many people out there, some kind of unexpected, who are on our side and do believe that we were really not treated the way that we should be treated at this time and in this place. And we just want to say, hey, we come in peace. We want good, positive change. We want us all to have as much fun as possible. Let's do it ethically and let's do it so everyone gets a piece of the Mm -hmm. pie. You know, we all get to come in and enjoy ourselves and have a good time. And that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. You know, will it be received with open arms? We hope so. And we are looking forward to that. And... Can we'll you, see how it goes. Can you explain to our audience for anyone like who didn't go to the AVN Awards or doesn't know much what about happened? It, like what specifically? So essentially what happens every year is the show runs long. Mm-hmm. Totally fine. They had a musical performer. Iggy Azalea was there. So that was fun. Um, and they had a lot of skits and comedy acts. And uh, Mr. Comedian Man, I'm sure, did the best he could. Um, but, you know, comedians are not performers uh they're not award show presenters the gay vn gets it right every fucking year i fucking love going to the gay vn I feel like the it's gay always I've never so been. much fun I feel like oh be my so god fun. holly it's so much fun oh it's such a good time the red carpet is a good time S- seating is a good time the show is hilarious bruce valanche so i got to i usually present because my agent howard from fab scout is so amazing and he's friends with uh tony rios from avn But he usually gets me a spot to present an award, which I always love doing because uh, it's just, it's fun. You get to go on stage and shit. But um, the jokes they wrote for me this year were actually really funny. And Bruce Valanche at the end of the show, who is someone, I used to rent his comedy specials from Blockbuster when I was like 12 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, like always knew who this camp fucking funny ass man was. Told me after the, and I started crying because I was just like, oh, my God, this is so overwhelming. I'm shaking. He said, you are so funny and your timing is terrific. And I wept because I'm like, this is the validation I didn't know I needed <laughs> that I rightfully deserve. And I'm so just enamored with him. And it was just I'm so grateful that that meeting was able to take place because that really at a time when I was so tired and exasperated and physically and emotionally and mentally like drained, that was the kick in the pants that I needed Mm -hmm. to just say like, keep fucking going. Mm -hmm. But, um, so what happened was, uh, all this stuff sort of occurred that we knew was going to happen. And the end of the show is when they announced all, when everyone is like getting up to like leave, basically they announced, well, not necessarily, but kind of, they announced uh, uh, Trans Performer of the Year, which is one of the top categories. Uh, they announced Best Thespian, and unfortunately, Daily, Daisy Taylor, who won, um, was sick with the flu, as most people were, mm-hmm. uh, after the show. She got it first. So um, they did announce her category, and she was not there. And so uh, Aubrey Kate accepted on her behalf, which was really nice. Um, but... No trans people were on that stage except for Aubrey. Um, She wasn't exactly treated with the warmth and dignity that she deserved either uh, behind the scenes. And um, they did not 
announce MILF Performer of the Year. They did not announce any of the BBW categories because they are fan vote and they always save fan vote categories for uh, Grand Reel, as they call it, the last sort of big chunk that they boom, 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 get yeah. out there. So for those of you who don't know, like there's the stage accepting awards, which everybody always wants. And and you don't actually know what's going to be a stage accepting no, award. No, you don't. And I even asked them. that happens them, every year. And they said, we don't know. until It'll always be performer of the year, grand reel, like director of the year. all performer of the years should be on stage, in I, my opinion. I don't disagree with you on and that. And then I also feel, once again, you know, they like to say, okay, well, it was pushed to grand reel because we didn't have time. Why is it at the end? Mm -hmm. Why are we still in the back of the bus? Mm -hmm. Okay. We are a part of this community as performers. Mm -hmm. The BBW performers and the MILF performers are bringing in just as much as these other people. Mm -hmm. Why are they still at the end? Yeah. Let's mix it up. Let's disperse it. Okay. Yeah. That's all we're asking. We're not asking for special or preferential treatment. We're not asking that you fucking bend over and tuck our asses or something. Like, we just want to be with everybody else because we are a part of everybody else. Why are these same awards being given out every single year? And there's not even, like, a person who receives this word award. It's an entire uh, conglomerate or an entity or a toy brand or this or that or whatever. It's a little gratuitous, it feels like. And it's not exactly the most exciting to watch. Mm -hmm. You know what's exciting? A drunk uh, whoever performer going up on stage and gushing and having a great time and bantering and then getting off stage and you get to feel that excitement with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that genuine thrill. There used to be a grit and like an excitement and an exhilaration with the award shows. That just, it, it feels kind of corporatized now. Mm -hmm. doesn't feel as like authentic and fun mm -hmm. as much. I miss when things were fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Am I, is that weird? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. So yeah, it's just like at the end there, there's a lot of categories. And so what they do at the end is everyone who they've decided isn't going to go up on stage because they, Time. Whatever, whatever, whatever the reason is. Um, there's literally just like, it just flashes the name of the winner on the screen yeah. in the category. And then it goes, it's just like a real quick kind of like. And then also understandable, they have to trim the categories themselves. When they announce all of the different people who are nominated for an award, it's a lot of fucking people. It's yeah. a lot of nominations. So yeah. sometimes they can't announce all of them. That hurts a lot of people's feelings too. There's nothing they can do about that if they're running late on time. They have to do it that way. And we mm -hmm. acknowledge that. That makes sense ethically. Mm -hmm. There are unethical things that nominate, are really frustrating. Nominate less people per category. Well, that's a thought. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> Could be less nominations because not everyone deserves a participation trophy, but you know, whatever. Who cares? <laughs> Fucking Gen X wants to complain about participation trophies. Okay. Because <laughs> that's not one. Yeah. <laughs> So um, speaking of, you know, award winning, in my opinion, um, you recently dropped your big budget seeing Gorgons and Goddesses. Yes, I sure did. Um, which you starred in, co-wrote, co-produced, and helped with hair and makeup and designed and made the costumes for. And wrote. I, I said that. Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I promise. <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> um, so that actually really... Uh, got my attention because my father was really into Greek mythology. He was like a Greek and Roman scholar. So like that was something like Greek mythology is a very big part of like, uh -huh. my childhood. And like I read Aww. all the stories and like all that. So I love anything like that. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's so rad. Yay. So tell us a little bit about that scene and um, what gave you the idea, designing it. Like how'd you put it all together? So the whole scene... Uh it's coming out VOD this month. It was supposed to come out last month, but we've had a lot of technical issues as of late. Um, it will be on Adult Empire and a lot of the um, sister companies of it. But it's a full scene. Right now, we only have the orgy that's out, but there's a narrative portion that goes along with it that kind of breaks down what the scene is. And it's an analogy for how 
we as performers have autonomy now and the studio system is evolving and changing and taking a step back in a lot of ways. And there's so much option, so many options for performers to do their own thing. And the story of Medusa has always really spoken to me. I love that in the 70s, the women's Revol- uh, liberation movement sort of took her as a symbol of feminine rage and said, this is a woman who was wronged and punished for it. Let's reframe that as a woman who is so powerful and that power sort of was instigated because of the disenfranchisement she experienced. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to take this Medusa story and like extrapolate on it and make it like something really hot because it, it just spoke to me so much. And um, it really came about because there's this colloquial thing in LA where it's, I think it started here. I'm not hundred percent sure where trans women are referred to as dolls and we call each other dolls and we call ourselves dolls. And I was joking with my friends, uh, Jay Venus and Tori Easton about how if they're the dolls, we're the Gorgons. Like we're, <laughs> I'm a bridge troll, <laughs> I'm not a doll. So we thought that was so funny and it just grew from there. And then adult time, Bree Mills, she did this series called Muses. So this idea of trans women being muses was also in my head. And so I am fortunate enough that, you know, um, I have this mama goose energy and I was able to get all of the muses plus some who did scenes last year to come together for this 11 girl orgy, which I don't know if that's ever happened before. Not in my mind. Hmm. It was 11 girls who were involved in that orgy, all trans and, um, a lot of trans representation behind the scenes, a lot of feminine power behind the scenes. We had, um, there was just so much syncopation with the way that we were all on the same page. We all wanted it to be good. We all wanted this to like be awesome. And we did it. It's super camp. It's the, the scene itself is almost cringy, like a 1960s horror movie Mm -hmm. where it's like comically. Yeah. Silly. As long as that's what you're going for, it then it's was great, so right? so fun. Like, well, it wasn't what we were going for, but that's why you live and you learn. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad that it turned out to be a product that I'm super proud of, even though it is different than what I had initially anticipated. Yeah. But it's the first of many. 1015 Group is the production company that I co-produced that with. And we are sponsoring it at the T Awards this year. So we're going to have a lot more um, visibility as a production company and do more of these like fun, creative productions that are more big budget. They are content trades. And that's what's so great about this concept that we're using at 1015. We are uh, using a model where they are content trades that the girls are able to post on their OnlyFans and all of their pay sites. And then we also own the content. So we are able to upload it to VOD sites and get those content trades that we did that were so beautiful and we put so much heart and soul into nominated for awards. Mm. So it's this really great new concept that we're, we're using. Maybe not new, but it's what it's new to us. Mm -hmm. And um, it gives the girls equity, you know, and it also gives us the accolades that hard work deserves. Yeah. You know, and once again, it's not about the awards. It's not about the award shows. We're grateful and so happy to be there and we love going to them. But at the end of the day, it's about making a living because at the end of the day, my bills are getting paid Mm -hmm. and I'm enjoying doing it. But um, it's, just one of those bonuses, those extra like, oh, fuck yeah. Like everyone likes it and and they gave us a trophy for it. Like, yeah. oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Awesome. And if we don't get a trophy for it, who fucking cares? Yeah. I'm, I didn't have one picture shown of me at the AVN this year. I don't fucking care because I was on every fucking cover of all my DVDs that I was in this year. I don't care. At the end of the it day. If it makes you feel any better in 25 years, this is the only year that I ever got my picture to show to AVN. Hey, and Hall of Fame. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's yeah. the only reason why. It was because it was Hall of Fame. But could, that's the only time. Worse. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, find your 
things that you can be grateful for and yeah. just hold on to that. There's so much to be grateful for. Don't so true. You know, don't, don't get caught up in all ugh. that. Yeah. Absolutely. It's such a dangerous industry because we get caught in that uh, comparison sort of cycle mm-hmm. and you just can't do that. It's, there's a difference between the standard and acknowledging the standard and then comparing yourself to others and saying, why am I not doing it like that? Why am I not getting this opportunity and blah, 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 blah. Another reason why I'm so grateful to be here. There's been so little trans representation in like mainstream and people like Emma Rose who fucking penetrate the mainstream and are unapologetically authentically themselves. It's just such a great opportunity for us as the trans community. She makes such a great ambassador for us. And Natasha Dreams, another great ambassador for us. Gracie Jane, another great ambassador for us. Brittany Cade, another great ambassador for us. Like there's just so many people um, that are putting in the groundwork. Leilani Lee, our trans newcomer of the year at AVN. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're just so uh, able to be out there now. Yeah. Which is something that we haven't had. And it's it's exciting to be a part of it, but the work's not done. Yeah. So we've still got a long ways to go and it's it's going to be an exciting experience to make the world a better place, you know? Yeah. It's, it's fucking cool. Yeah. I also have a, a Medusa prequel coming out, which oh. is going to be fun. So Ooh, we're working exciting. on the script for that as well. A little, Very cool. how'd she get there mm-hmm. you know, sort of. Situation. It sounds like it was a really fun set to be on. Did you guys shoot behind we had the so scenes? Much fun. Oh, the girls shot a lot of BTS because I was producing it. I have like almost no BTS footage of me because I'm like running around screaming and pointing all day. Mm-hmm. But um, the girls got a lot of beautiful BTS. Brittany, Emma, and Gia Gunn, who signed on to be a non sex role, she was the muse of comedy. Mm-hmm. I wrote that for her. And she has a few fun lines in the narrative portion. And they got some beautiful BTS content that I'm so grateful that they got. But uh, we shot it at um, uh, Kelly Holland's place. Oh, yeah. The I actually, Animal Sanctuary. I, I recognized it. Yeah. When I saw the picture, I'm like, yeah, that's Kelly's place. So, um, <laughs> and she's another one who just gets it. Yeah. An artist, you yeah. know, through and through. And so it, it was a fun day. It was exhausting. I have scars on my body to this day from, I was in, like nine inch platforms because my friends are tall and I wanted to be in the middle, but I didn't want it to be weird. So I was wearing super short. Yeah. Uh, She's tall without heels. So she wore some small ones, but we were shooting in that like rocky portion in Mm -hmm. the center of the property. And I took quite a few tumbles and there's some footage of my tumbles (laughs) and we will be editing that together. So everyone can see just how many times I fell and hurt myself (laughs) that day. Well, that's a commitment to your craft. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Ariel. Um, I do have some Patreon questions that I'd like to ask you in a separate little segment. Hell yeah, let's do it. Um, But in the meantime, can you let everybody know where they can find you online? I am Ariel Demure on all platforms. I'm on OnlyFans. I'm on Pornhub. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on uh, technically Reddit. If one of you want to be my Reddit moderator, let me know. Um, but yeah, I'm fortunate enough that I haven't been banned from anything yet. So knock on wood. You got your actual just, just your name. Just Google Ariel Demure. You'll find everything you need to find amongst things that I wish you couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Holly Randall. I'm at on TikTok at Holly Randall and Filtered. And um, I'm also on Reddit. I forget. I think it's Holly Randall. I don't know. I'm mostly Holly Randall and mostly everything. Yeah. Um, but uh, and if you want to watch these episodes live and get access to bonus content like the Q&A we're going to do, uh, join Patreon.com slash Holly Randall. Thank you guys so much for being here and I will see you next week. <laughs>